Chapter Three of Queen Elizabeth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Queen Elizabeth by Jacob Abbott. Chapter Three, Lady Jane Grey. Among Elizabeth's companions and playmates in her early years was a young lady, her cousin, as she was often called, though she was really the daughter of her cousin, named Jane Grey commonly called in history Lady Jane Grey. Her mother was the Marchioness of Dorset, and was the daughter of one of King Henry the Eighth's sisters. King Henry had named her as the next in order of succession after his own children, that is, after Edward his son, and Mary and Elizabeth his two daughters, and consequently, though she was very young yet, as she might one day be Queen of England, she was a personage of considerable importance." She was accordingly kept near the court, and shared in some respects the education and the studies of the two princesses. Lady Jane was about four years younger than the Princess Elizabeth, and the sweetness of her disposition, united with an extraordinary intellectual superiority, which showed itself at a very early period, made her a universal favourite. Her father and mother, the Marquise and Marchioness of Dorset, lived at an estate they possessed, called Broadgate, in Leicestershire which is the central part of England, although they took their title from the county of Dorset, which is on the southwestern coast. They were very proud of their daughter, and attached infinite importance to her descent from Henry the Seventh, and to the possibility that she might one day succeed to the English throne. They were very strict and severe in their manners, and paid great attention to etiquette and punctilio, as persons who are ambitious of rising in the world are very apt to do. In all ages of the world, and among all nations, those who have long been accustomed to a high position are easy and unconstrained in their manners and demeanour, while those who have been newly advanced from a lower station, or who are anticipating or aspiring to such an advance, make themselves slaves to the rules of etiquette and ceremony. It was thus that the father and mother of Lady Jane, anticipating that she might one day become queen, watched and guarded her incessantly, subjected her to a thousand unwelcome restraints, and repressed all the spontaneous and natural gaiety and sprightliness which belongs properly to such a child. She became, however, a very excellent scholar in consequence of the state of things. She had a private teacher, a man of great eminence for his learning and abilities, and yet of a very kind and gentle spirit, which enabled him to gain a strong hold on his pupil's affection and regard. His name was John Almer. The Marquise of Dorset, Lady Jane's father, became acquainted with Mr. Almer when he was quite young, and appointed him, when he had finished his education, to come and reside in his family as chaplain and tutor to his children. Almer afterward became a distinguished man, was made Bishop of London, and held many high offices of state under Queen Elizabeth, when she came to reign. He became very much attached to Queen Elizabeth in the middle and latter part of his life, as he had been to Lady Jane in the early part of it. A curious incident occurred during the time that he was in the service of Elizabeth, which illustrates the character of the man. The queen was suffering from the toothache, and it was necessary that the tooth should be extracted. The surgeon was ready with his instruments, and several ladies and gentlemen of the royal household were in the queen's room commiserating her sufferings, but the queen dreaded the operation, so excessively that she could not summon fortitude enough to submit to it. Almer, after trying some time in vain to encourage her, took his seat in the chair instead of her, and said to the surgeon, "'I am an old man, and have but few teeth to lose.' but come, draw this one, and let Her Majesty see how light a matter it is. One would not have supposed that Elizabeth would have allowed this to be done, but she did, and finding that Almer made so light of the operation, she submitted to have it performed upon herself. But to return to Lady Jane. She was very strongly attached to her teacher, and made great progress in the studies which he arranged for her. Ladies of high rank in those days were accustomed to devote great attention to the ancient and modern languages. There was, in fact, a great necessity then, as indeed there is now, for a European princess to be acquainted with the principal languages of Europe. For the various royal families were continually intermarrying with each other, which led to a great many visits and other intercourse between the different courts. There was also a great deal of intercourse with the Pope, in which the Latin tongue was the medium of communication. Lady Jane devoted a great deal of time to all these studies, and made rapid proficiency in them all. The Princess Elizabeth was also an excellent scholar. Her teacher was a very learned and celebrated man, named Roger Ascham. She spoke French and Italian as fluently as she did English. 
She also wrote and spoke Latin with correctness and readiness. She made considerable progress in Greek, too. She could write the Greek character very beautifully, and could express herself tolerably well in conversation in that language. One of her companions, a young lady of the name of Cecil, is said to have spoken Greek as well as English. Roger Ascham took great interest in advancing the princess in these studies, and in the course of these his instructions he became acquainted with Lady Jane, and he praises very highly in his letters the industry and assiduity of Lady Jane in similar pursuits. One day Roger Ascham, being on a journey from the north of England to London, stopped to make a call at the mansion of the Marquis of Dorset. He found that the family were away. They had gone off upon a hunting excursion in the park. Lady Jane, however, had been left at home, and Ascham went in to see her. He found her in the library reading Greek. Ascham examined her a little, and was very much surprised to find how well acquainted with the language she had become, although she was then only about fifteen years old. He told her that he should very much like to have her write him a letter in Greek, and this she readily promised to do. He asked her also how it happened that, at her age, she had made such advances in learning. "'I will tell you,' said she, "'how it has happened. One of the greatest benefits that God ever conferred upon me was in giving me so sharp and severe parents, and so gentle a teacher, for when I was in the presence of either my father or mother, whether I speak, keep silence, sit, stand, or go eat, drink, be merry or sad, be sewing, playing, dancing, or doing anything else, I must do it, as it were, in just such a weight, measure, and number, as perfectly as possible, or else I am so sharply taunted, so cruelly threatened, presently, sometimes with pinches, nips, and bobs, and other ways, which I will not name for the honour I bear my parents, that I am continually teased and tormented. And then, when the time comes for me to go to Mr. Elmser, he teaches me so gently, so pleasantly, and with such fair allurements to learning, that I think all the time nothing while I am with him. And I am always sorry to go away from him, because whatsoever else I do but learning is full of grief, trouble, fear, and suffering. Lady Jane was an intimate friend and companion of the young King Edward as long as he lived. Edward died when he was sixteen years of age, so that he did not reach the period which his father had assigned for his reigning in his own name. One of King Edward's most prominent and powerful ministers during the latter part of his life was the Earl of Northumberland. The original name of the Earl of Northumberland was John Dudley. He was one of the train who came in the possession at the close of the baptism of Elizabeth, carrying the presents. He was a Protestant, and was very friendly to Edward and to Lady Jane Grey, for they were Protestants too. But his feelings and policy were hostile to Mary, for she was a Catholic. Mary sometimes treated very harshly by him, and she was subjected many privations and hardships on account of her religious faith. The government of Edward justified these measures, on account of the necessity of promoting the Reformation, and discouraging propery by every means in their power. Northumberland supposed, too, that it was safe to do this, for Edward, being very young, it was probable that he would live and reign a long time. It is true that Mary was named, in her father's will, as his successor, if she outlived him, but then it was highly probable that she would not outlive him, for she was several years older than he. All these calculations, however, were spoiled by the sudden failure of Edward's health when he was sixteen years old. Northumberland was very much alarmed at this. He knew at once that if Edward should die, and Mary succeed him, all his power would be gone, and he determined to make desperate efforts to prevent such a result. It must not be understood, however, that in coming to this resolution, Northumberland considered himself as intending and planning a deliberate usurpation of power. There was a real uncertainty in respect to the question who was the true and rightful heir to the crown. Northumberland was, undoubtedly, strongly biased by his interest, but he may have been unconscious of the bias, and in advocating the mode of succession on which the continuance of his own power depended, he may have really believed that he was only maintaining what was in itself rightful and just." In fact, there is no mode which human ingenuity has ever yet devised, for determining the hands in which the supreme executive of a nation shall be lodged, which will always avoid doubt and contention. If this power devolves by hereditary descent, no rules can be made so minute and full, as that cases will not sometimes occur that will transcend them. If, on the other hand, the plan of election be adopted, there will often be technical doubts about a portion of the votes, and cases will sometimes occur where the result will depend upon this doubtful portion. Thus, there will be disputes under any system, and ambitious men will seize such occasions to struggle for power. 
In order that our readers may clearly understand the nature of the plan which Northumberland adopted, we present on the following page a sort of genealogical table of the royal family of England in the days of Elizabeth. By examination of this table, it will be seen that King Henry the Seventh left a son and two daughters. The son was King Henry the Eighth, and he had three children. His third child was King Edward the Sixth, who was now about to die. The other two were the princesses Mary and Elizabeth, who would naturally be considered the next heirs after Edward, and besides, King Henry had left a will, as has already been explained, confirming their rights to the succession. This will he had made near the time of his death, but it will be recollected that, during his lifetime, both the marriages from which these princesses had sprung had been formally annulled. His marriage with Catherine of Aragon had been annulled on one plea, and that of Anne Boleyn on another. Both these decrees of annulment had afterward been revoked, and the right of the princesses to succeed had been restored, or attempted to be restored, by the will. Still, it admitted of a question, after all, whether Mary and Elizabeth were to be considered as the children of true and lawful wives or not. If they were not, then Lady Jane Grey was the next heir, for she was placed next to the princesses by King Henry the Eighth's will. This will, for some reason or other, set aside the descendants of Margaret, who went to Scotland as the wife of James the Fourth of that country. What right the king had thus to disinherit the children of his sister Margaret was a great question. Among her descendants was Mary, Queen of Scots, as will be seen by the table, and she was at this time the representative of that branch of the family. The friends of Mary, Queen of Scots, claimed that she was the lawful heir to the English throne after Edward. They maintained that the marriage of Catherine, the Princess Mary's mother, and also that of Anne Boleyn, Elizabeth's mother, had both been annulled, and that the will could not restore them. They maintained also that the will was equally powerless in setting aside the claims of Margaret, her grandmother. Mary, Queen of Scots, though silent now, advanced her claim subsequently, and made Elizabeth a great deal of trouble. Then there was, besides these, a third party, who maintained that King Henry the Eighth's will was not effectual in legalizing again the annulled marriages, but that it was sufficient to set aside the claims of Margaret. Of course with them, Lady Jane Grey, who, as will be seen by the table, was the representative of the second sister of Henry the Eighth, was the only heir. The Earl of Northumberland embraced this view. His motive was to raise Lady Jane Grey to the throne, in order to exclude the Princess Mary, whose accession he knew very well would bring all his greatness to a very sudden end. The Earl of Northumberland was at this time the principal minister of the young king. The protector, Somerset, had fallen long ago. Northumberland, whose name was then John Dudley, had supplanted him, and had acquired so great influence and power at court, that almost everything seemed to be at his disposal. He was, however, generally hated by the other courtiers and by the nation. Men who gain the confidence of a young or feeble-minded prince, so as to wield a great power not properly their own, are almost always odious. It was expected, however, that his career would soon be brought to an end, as all knew that King Edward must die, and it was generally understood that Mary was to succeed him. Northumberland, however, was very anxious to devise some scheme to continue his power, and in resolving the subject in his mind, he conceived of plans which seemed to promise not only to continue, but also greatly to increase it. His scheme was to have the princess's claims set aside, and Lady Jane Grey raised to the throne. He had several sons. One of them was young, handsome, and accomplished. He thought of proposing him to Lady Jane's father as the husband of Lady Jane, and to induce the Marquise to consent to this plan, he promised to obtain a dukedom for him by means of his influence with the king. The Marquise agreed to the proposal. Lady Jane did not object to the husband they offered her. The dukedom was obtained, and the marriage, together with two others which Northumberland had arranged to strengthen his influence, were celebrated all on the same day, with great festivities and rejoicings. The people looked on moodily, jealous and displeased, though they had no open ground of displeasure except that it was unsuitable to have such scenes of gaiety and rejoicing among the high officers of the court, while the young monarch himself was lying upon his dying bed. They did not yet know that it was Northumberland's plan to raise his new daughter-in-law to the throne. Northumberland thought it would greatly increase his prospect of success if he could obtain some act of acknowledgment of Lady Jane's claims to the crown before Edward died. An opportunity soon occurred for effecting this purpose. One day, as he was sitting by young Edward's bedside, he turned the conversation to the subject of the Reformation, which had made great progress during Edward's reign, and he led Edward on in the conversation, 
until he remarked that it was a great pity to have the work all undone by Mary's accession, for she was a Catholic, and would, of course, endeavour to bring the country back again under the spiritual dominion of Rome. Northumberland then told him that there was one way, and one way only, to avert such a calamity, and that was to make Lady Jane his heir instead of Mary. King Edward was a very thoughtful, considerate, and conscientious boy, and was very desirous of doing what he considered his duty. He thought it was his duty to do all in his power to sustain the Reformation, and to prevent the Catholic power from gaining ascendancy in England again. He was therefore easily persuaded to accede to Northumberland's plan, especially as he was himself strongly attached to Lady Jane, who had often been his playmate and companion. The king accordingly sent for three judges of the realm, and directed them to draw up a deed of assignment, by which the crown was to be conveyed to Lady Jane on the young king's death, Mary and Elizabeth being alike excluded. The judges were afraid to do this, for by King Henry the Eighth's settlement of the crown, all those persons who should do anything to disturb the secession as he arranged it, were declared to be guilty of high treason. The judges knew very well, therefore, that if they should do what the king required of them, and then, if the friends of Lady Jane should fail of establishing her upon the throne, the end of the affair would be the cutting off of their own heads in the tower. They represented this to the king, and begged to be excused from the duty that he required of them. Northumberland was in a great rage at this, and seemed almost ready to break out against the judges in open violence. They, however, persisted in their refusal to do what they well knew would subject them to the pains and penalties of treason. Northumberland, finding that threats and violence would not succeed, contrived another mode of obviating the difficulty. He proposed to protect the judges from any possible evil consequences by a formal pardon for it, signed by the king, and sealed with the great seal, so that in case they were ever charged with treason, the pardon would save them from punishment. This plan succeeded. The pardon was made out, being written with great formality upon a parchment roll, and sealed with the great seal. The judges then prepared and signed the deed of settlement, by which the crown was given to Lady Jane, though after all they did it with much reluctance and many forebodings. Northumberland next wanted to contrive some plan for getting the princesses into his power, in order to prevent their heading any movement in behalf of their own claims at the death of the king. He was also desirous of making such arrangements as to conceal the death of the king for a few days after it should take place, in order that he might get Lady Jane and her officers in complete possession of the kingdom before the demise of the crown should be generally known. For this purpose he dismissed the regular physicians who had attended upon the king, and put him under the charge of a woman, who pretended that she had medicine that would certainly cure him. He sent also messengers to the princesses, who were then in the country north of London, requesting that they would come to Greenwich to be near the sick chamber where their brother was lying, that they might cheer and comfort him in his sickness and pain. The princesses obeyed the summons. They each set out immediately upon the journey, and moved toward London on their way to Greenwich. In the meantime, Edward was rapidly declining. The change in the treatment which took place when his physicians left him made him worse instead of better. His cough increased, his breathing became more laboured and difficult. In a word, his case presented all the symptoms of approaching dissolution. At length he died. Northumberland attempted to keep the fact concealed until after the princesses should arrive, that he might get them into his power. Some faithful friend, however, made all haste to meet them, in order to inform them what was going on. In this way Mary received intelligence of her brother's death when she had almost reached London, and was informed also of the plans of Northumberland for raising Lady Jane to the throne. The two princesses were extremely alarmed, and both turned back at once toward the northward again. Mary stopped to write a letter to the council, remonstrating against their delay in proclaiming her queen, and then proceeded rapidly to a strong castle at a place called Farmingham, in the county of Suffolk, on the eastern coast of England. She made this her headquarters, because she supposed that the people of that county were particularly friendly to her, and then, besides, it was near the sea, and in case the course of events should turn against her, she could make her escape to foreign lands. It is true that the prospect of being fugitive and an exile was very dark and gloomy, but it was not so terrible as the idea of being shut up a prisoner in the tower, or beheaded on a block for treason. In the meantime Northumberland went, at the head of a troop of his adherents, to the residence of Lady Jane Grey, informed her of the death of Edward, and announced to her their determination to proclaim her queen. Lady Jane was very much astonished at this news. 
At first she absolutely refused the offered honour, but the solicitations and urgency of Northumberland, and of her father and her young husband, at length prevailed. She was conducted to London, and instated in at least the semblance of power. As the news of these transactions spread throughout the land, a universal and strong excitement was produced, everybody at once taking sides either for Mary or Lady Jane. Bands of armed men began to assemble. It soon became apparent, however, that beyond the immediate precincts of London the country was almost unanimous for Mary. They dreaded, it is true, the danger which they anticipated from her Catholic faith, but still they had all considered it a settled point, since the death of Henry the Eighth, that Mary was to reign whenever Edward should die, and this general expectation that she would be queen had passed insensibly into an opinion that she ought to be. Considered strictly as a legal question, it was certainly doubtful which of the four claimants to the throne had the strongest title, but the public were not disposed to so regard it. They chose, on the whole, that Mary should reign. Large military masses consequently flocked to her standard. Elizabeth took sides with her, and as it was important to give as much public effect to her adhesion as possible, they furnished Elizabeth with a troop of a thousand horsemen, at the head of which she rode to meet Mary and tender her aid. Northumberland went forth at the head of such forces as he could collect, but he soon found that the attempt was vain. His troops forsook him. The castles which had at first been under his command surrendered themselves to Mary. The Tower of London went over to her side. Finally, all being lost, Northumberland himself was taken prisoner, and all his influential friends with him, and were committed to the Tower. Lady Jane herself, too, together with her husband and father, were seized and sent to prison. Northumberland was immediately put on trial for treason. He was condemned, and brought at once to the block. In fact, the whole affair moved very promptly and rapidly on, from its commencement to its consummation. Edward the Sixth died on the 5th of July, and it was only the 22nd of August when Northumberland was beheaded. The period for which the unhappy Lady Jane enjoyed the honour of being called a queen was nine days. It was about a month after this that Mary passed from the Tower through the city of London in a grand triumphal procession to be crowned. The royal chariot, covered with cloth of golden tissue, was drawn by six horses most splendidly caparisoned. Elizabeth, who had aided her sister, so far as she could, in the struggle, was admitted to share the triumph. She had a carriage drawn by six horses, too, with cloth and decorations of silver. They proceeded in this manner, attended and followed by a great cavalcade of nobles and soldiery, to Westminster Abbey, where Mary took her seat with great formality upon her father's throne. End of chapter 3